Okay. Uh, well, thanks to, to the organizers to invite me here. In any conference, there has to be a strange talk, and this is it. So I'm not going to assume that you, you guys are familiar with anything I'm going to say, and uh, the main idea I want to present is, is a conjecture that uh, I just wanted to share and see what you think about it. This is about uh, modeling and theory. And it is connected with a number of issues that have been uh, coming out in, in the more recent literature about the, the relevance of evolution in thinking in cancer as a disease and what's the implications for, for uh, treatment. And when we talk about evolution, usually everyone is thinking in the guy at uh, left, uh, Darwin, and the idea that you know, natural selection is what shapes uh, most of it. Um, but actually, there's a number of issues and uh, problems that uh, emerge when you try to think in particular in qualitative phenomena that happen in evolution and how major changes happen. And that implies that you need to go into um, different ways of looking at the problems. Um, and that includes things like, what is the role of hi historical events when you think in evolution, whether or not they dominate what you see as the outcome? Um, whether phenomena like cooperation, which uh, in evolution is much more important, probably in many ways, than natural selection, and whether very fundamental constraints happen to occur. So uh, you can think in what Stephen Gould said uh, a long time ago about the idea that uh, history is absolutely fundamental. So what happened at the beginning strongly affects the outcome. But in fact, um, for the people working in complex systems, we have evidences that suggest that that might not be the case, that uh, evolution is strongly constrained and that not everything is possible. Uh, some of my, my uh, former supervisors defended a long time ago, Brian Goodwin and Stuart Kaufman. And I was, I was having the idea of going into through all these things, but it's completely unfeasible given the time that we have. So I'm going more to use uh, some of the ideas that uh, considered relevant in evolution and microevolution in the context of cancer, and think about one particular topic that obsesses me since uh, I started to think about that, which is genetic instability, right? And, um, and an idea that uh, we formulated some, some years ago about the possibility that there might be a, a minimal cancer cell network. Um, I mentioned Steve Gould. Um, uh, I just wanted to mention very briefly that the idea that we'll, we'll recapitulate at the end about contingency and convergence. That evolution might be historical in a way, and in cancer we can think about that is because every patient, you could say, is different in a way. Um, I put here the famous book by Gould, uh, Wonderful Life. It's based in this, in this movie that you might have seen. If not, I, I do recommend the idea that you know, in the movie there's this very nice guy who has, is in trouble at some point. Uh, he comes an angel, which is a very annoying guy, actually. Right here, and he had the opportunity of see what will be the world if I hadn't bo been born, right? And of course, the world will be much worse, and uh, a single person can strongly affect. And the other extreme of the of the picture is uh, something that we see in evolution very often: is convergence. Not everything is possible, and we see how evolution has invented things like the eye. The eye has been invented, our complex eye, many times independently, right? But the design is the same. Right? So it's not like it's a repertoire of possibilities. This, this is a book I strongly recommend, Life Solution. The title suggests like a self-help book, but it's not. It's about evolutionary convergence. And of course, in cancer, and that again, I'm going to take that uh, later on, we have a number of dynamical issues that are very, very important that drive many things at very different scales. And in particular, I want to highlight the, the thing that we see in biology very often, and it's very different from what uh, an engineer will, will actually uh, think in design, is a conflict of things that have to do in, of uh, maintaining uh, complex organisms that usually require conflicting dynamics. You know, you have to grow, but you have to control the way you grow, right? And there's an, a number of things that uh, unfold here. And, and one very important thing, I'm taking all the elements I'm going to, to need, is space that many of you probably know very well. You know, heterogeneity in space, in particular in, in the context of cancer, is very important. But it was in ecology. And, and understanding and recognizing that, as, as uh, simple as it can seem today, um, 
took a while, right? And we know that the impact of space uh, is huge. And it's huge in maintaining diversity. It's important for, well, you'll see some equations, but that's not important here. It's important in trying to understand the dynamics of some particular processes, like uh, how tumors expand. But one very important thing and I just wanted to mention very briefly is that, and that's something that we contributed to that some years ago, well, some, a lot of years ago, um, was the idea that uh, when you look at the standard ecology, one of the things that you see in the lab is that when you put two species to compete with resources, very often one species excludes the other, right? That seems kind of an interesting thing because in, in ecosystems we see a very high diversity and competition goes against this. And one interesting thing is that you can go into the field and see the same two species coexisting, right? So we, many years ago, we thought about that with, um, particularly with my colleague, Jordi Vasconte, which, who was my first PhD student. And we thought, okay, what happens when you put two competitors in space to compete, right? And what happened is, in the end, it's very simple, is that um, if you have black for one of the species present and white and present, what happens is that actually you see the dynamics here, you put the two species in competition, and in some places one excludes the other, in some places it's the other, the other way around. Space strongly limits competition, so you compete with your neighbors, right? And that makes a big difference, because you can sustain diversity despite that the principle of, of exclusion is there. And that, and that uh, turns out to be very important. Now it's very, very much recognized in the context of, of cancer heterogeneity, that against the, the original intuition that the clonal selection thing should generate essentially homogeneous tumors. Uh, we know now that that's not the case. That's a paper we published in PNAs a while ago with in particular by my, my colleague at Yale, uh, Jose Costa, which actually was, I think, one of the pioneering studies where it was shown that actually if you have, this is from uh, modeling of the, of the samples that we analyzed from colon cancer, where you see spatial heterogeneity that cannot be understood unless you think in this spatially constrained world where competition is just local, right? And the, the right way of approaching that is thinking in metapopulation. So you have a spatial uh, distribution of cells in the, in the context of colon cancer, and uh, you don't compete with everyone else. You compete just with your neighbors. And that's as simple as it is makes a big difference because that is what sustains heterogeneity. It has a lot of impact, for example, in the, in the, in the way things happen in time, in the way you have to consider uh, the role played by heterogeneity, and uh, it has many other implications. I'm not going to for do, for do, to do that. Well, my, my obsession comes from, from this, from many years asking oncologists and people working on cancer about instability, right? Uh, we, you will know that uh, most uh, cancers display these particular kind of phenotypes where you see um, scrambled uh, chromosomes that will not be allowed in a, in a, in a so-called normal cell, right? Uh, so a, a first question is how in hell this remains alive, okay? What happened with all the control mechanisms there? And this is something that we can see in time. This is a, is a, is a process where uh, history plays clearly a role, but also strong constraints apply. And that's what, the, the reason why patho pathologists look at the sample and despite things have been changing over time, the context of the tissue makes, makes possible to see, uh, to say this is a particular kind of cancer of grade one, two, three, et cetera. But the instability has a big impact. It makes the system apparently more and more disordered. Right? What is the advantage of that? And some people, um, this is paper in 2000, discuss this idea that uh, maybe instability has an optimal uh, um, level value. And actually, if you're not, if you're not uh, unstable, you're not going to uh, go through selection barriers. If you are too unstable, you might be in trouble because you easily generate things that are not going to persist. Maybe a just right optimal level of instability that makes you uh, to progress. That, I think, is, a, is a, an interesting suggestion. And we had some other views of that. Um, and a number of questions that, that have, to be, have to be raised when you try to understand that. So how do you pile up instability, and what is the limit of that? And what, what is the meaning of that limit, right? Uh, is that is really a kind of a selection for an optimal, or is something else, OK? Um, and in, from the point of view of theory, we, we do mainly theory, 
there's a lot of problems that arise from that. I just put this for, the, for those of you who are, might be interested in, in the mathematical story. For example, if you want to make a mathematical model for the amount or the average value of instability, that means you need an equation for a variable that changes over time. And changes over time, changing itself. So it's not trivial at all. Uh, so we did some progress, but a lot of stuff has to be done. This was done with my, my student, Gima Wade. Let me make a little parenthesis, right? Uh, that's, that's going to be strange, I know, but, but stay with me, right? This is what you say to the patient when he's dying, isn't it? Was, stay with me. So, um, in physics, there's this idea, what I'm going to, to need, because I'm going to claim that genetic instability um, reaches that kind of behavior. You have this idea of phase transition, uh, right? Um, you, know, you know that when you put uh, water and it becomes steam. This is a phase transition, you go from one, two states different. One very famous example is, uh, is the magnet, right? So here we are in a conference on evolution talking about magnets. Um, you know what a magnet is, right? Uh, one, one thing that many people doesn't know is that, it's very well known observation, that if you put a magnet um, under uh, higher and higher temperatures, you lose magnetization. So the magnet essentially becomes no, non-magnet. And that happens with a very peculiar shape. It could be kind of the magnetization, this temperature, so I increase temperature, everything seems fine, and then whoop, rapidly I go down and I have this critical point when essentially you go from one state to the other, right? So uh, understanding uh, these uh, was a really important part of physics. You probably heard about physics and heard quantum mechanics and the, the Higgs boson, but that's a real interesting thing. Now that there's no one here in, in working on Higgs boson. Um, <laughs> so let me tell you this because this, this is an important, important story. Um, how do you make a model of, of a magnet? And, and the idea will be, okay, I need to know the the quantum mechanics and the, the number of protons and electrons, how they, you know, how they define the crystal lattice, et cetera, et cetera. That, that's what seems reasonable, right? Let's not do that. Let's, let's make a toy model, right? Physicists do a lot of toy modeling. The idea is imagine, just to make it very, very quickly, imagine that my magnet is a lattice, and in every node in the lattice, I have something that goes up or down, right? Just uh, minus one, plus one, that's all, right? Imagine that I tend to do what my neighbors do. So it's kind of a majority rule, okay? So if my neighbors, the majority is pointing up, I'm trying to do the same thing, right? But if, if there's temperature, if there's, if there's heat, if there's perturbations, right? I might fail to do that. My neighbors point up, but I, I don't follow them, right? And I go down. But that's, the, that's the idea of temperature, right? So. I do that model, essentially, it's a toy model. It's no quantum mechanics, it's nothing. It's, it's ridiculous, I know, right? I do it, and uh, just to tell you very quickly, um, what happens is that if, oops, sorry. What happens if I'm at, at, uh, at uh, low temperature, essentially, or either everyone go, tries to go up or down, right? So I may assume the average is the magnetization, is up, everyone up or down. If I cross a given temperature, that's what the, the model actually does, Right? I can show that essentially I go flat, so it's no magnetization, right? Because it's random. It happens with a phase transition, okay? So what happened with that model? It's called the, the Ising model. High temperature, right? I'm, I'm just, just around here, but essentially everyone is random. And then when I'm at the so-called critical point, everything is really interesting, right? We have fractal structures, we have fractal fluctuations, etc. My point is, um, Okay, I show you this model, and you can say, that's a toy model, it's nice. It's a qualitative explanation. The surprise is, and that's uh, a very deep thing we know in physics, when you look at this toy model, and you look at the critical point right here, okay, I can measure from my model uh, a number of, of measures, things that we call the critical exponents, right? I can do it in the lab. What they see in the lab, and what they see in this, in this toy model is exactly the same, right? And the deep reason for that, comes to an idea of this universality. Just to defend that very simple model can give quite good results, especially when I'm uh, close to criticality. Another point, um, I'm talking about temperature and here is something that is, is I'm tuning, right? It's high, low, but if I want to talk about the origins of that when I see natural systems, um, what is the origin of that? If I see systems that seem to display criticality, my point is that I might, 
that my suggestion is might be the case for unstable cancer. Um, how do I get into the critical phenomenon, right? That, that uh, was uh, an idea that uh, had this uh, old colleague of mine, uh, Per Bach, who unfortunately died from, from cancer before he saw the theory flourishing. Um, the idea of Per Bach was, um, I can actually explain that using um, a phenomenon that we see very easily, which is, uh, for example, the formation of a, of a sample, right? You, have all, you all have been kids and, you know, been in, in the beach or maybe not, but the idea is that if you drop grain, grains of sand um, in the beach, eventually you get uh, something that is growing, 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 and there's a critical angle of repose where everything changes. You cannot go beyond that point because it's critical, and every time you drop grains of sand, sometimes you have a little avalanche, sometimes you have a larger avalanche, and if you wait enough, you have really large avalanches, right? And these particular distributions that we see in earthquakes, etc., and that seems the the potential origin of how do you get into the critical state. Uh, Pear published this, this work, this, this book that I recommend, very modest title, How Nature Works, uh, which actually presents the basic theory. And um, a final point before going into the cancer story is that one thing that we know, especially in the last years, has been really, really interesting, is that many biological systems seem to be poised to these critical states. And uh, that state seems to provide a very strong source of robustness, reliability, and adaptation. Okay. So, um, how do we go into the genetic instability story for cancer and whether or not we can have inspiration from other area? And we got inspiration from RNA viruses, right? For the following reason. There's a bit of propaganda of a book which has published recently in Princeton University Press on viruses. You can now see the title, which is better. And let me tell you this, this is a very, very nice story. In the 70s, uh, these two guys, Manfred Eigen, who I recently, and Peter Schuster, um, approached the idea of uh, going beyond any specific system of what happened with a collection of replicators, right? Any kind of replicator. They were thinking in the prebiotic scenarios, but also with viruses that made mistakes, that mutate, right? So you replicate, but inevitably, and for, that's for RNA, you don't, you don't have machinery for, for actually taking care of the accuracy. From time to time, you make mistakes. How, how big can be the mutation rate, right? At that time, they did a model, we're not going into the details, uh, they did a mathematical model. Nobody had any idea about mutation rates in viruses. So there was, a, there was complete conjecture. And they came up with uh, a prediction which was that there is a critical mutation rate beyond which all information is lost. So there's no, no Darwinian selection anymore. You just go into the neutral, the neutral uh, random drift. And they made the prediction that mutation rates um, will scale up with the inverse of genome size, okay? Um, that's exactly what was found out. And, and I mean that uh, many years later. I mean that in two, in two ways. It was possible to measure mutation rates in RNA viruses, and if, uh, what was found essentially is RNA viruses live just in that critical point, right? They mutate as much as possible, but cannot mutate more than that, right? Because beyond that, you, you just die. So inspired in this idea, we thought, we thought uh, that was the time I was, I was at Yale working on this, on this special dynamics of cancer. That's the idea that if we compare RNA viruses and unstable cancer, trying to be careful, right? Um, we could say that in RNA viruses, mutation rates are critical, we know that. Uh, in unstable cancers, you know, advanced uh, dynamics, it's high, it's, it's, the question is, is it critical? Uh, they confront selection barriers in similar ways, they are highly heterogeneous populations, right, et cetera, et cetera. So we published this paper, uh, we call an error catastrophe in cancer, where essentially we show that with my colleague from Harvard, Tom Dieswick, that if you make the right analogies from, some, from Schuster's theory and make comparison with the standard models of cancer growth, the prediction is we should have a critical, a critical boundary for instability. Um, there's a number of things that it, the evidence for that still is indirect, right? Um, there's evidence that when you look for the number of chromosomal aberrations, you find out distributions that seems to the ones you expect from a critical system. Um, and this is the, the, the paper we actually suggested something that uh, I, I hope you, you give me feedback on that. 
uh, in bioassays uh, suggesting the following. If you get more and more unstable and you do it by essentially um, breaking a number of things related to connecting with others, being more and more and more uh, early in terms of the, of the developmental stages, et cetera, is it possible to have something that is kind of a minimal cancer cell network? So what, what do you keep to be alive, right? But uh, to persist within a, uh, an organism that puts you in, in, in front of selection barriers. Um, well, we learn a number of things from this paper. One, one thing I, I, I learned from that is that do not, do not allow the, the editor to choose your title, right? <laughs> the title original was, is there a, a, a minimal cancer cell network? Which kind of makes sense, right? So that, that killed the paper. Nobody looks at that. Because what, what the hell is that? Minimal replicating constraint, you know? Anyway. So um, just a little mathematics, just to show you that we, we went into very, very simple modeling. N is for normal cells. C is for cancer cells. We just assume that both replicate and both you know, try to uh, cope with the available space. And we did the following uh, uh, conjecture. And we had done this modeling in a number of ways. Imagine that the replication rate of cancer cells right, um, is constrained by two things. On the one hand, if you have a small instability, which will be kind of a, this, this parameter here, you can mutate genes that provides advantages. right? For example, I don't, I don't listen to the others, so I can replicate faster, et cetera. But on the other hand, and that's the term here, doesn't matter which exactly the form is. This is for the number of housekeeping genes. You cannot mutate too much, because you're going to damage things that you don't want to damage, right? So actually, this defines a kind of a landscape. And the prediction, and that's the important thing, is that there has to be a limit to that, a critical boundary for this, right? There has to be a critical mutation or instability rate for cancers. We have our own predictions that have not been tested yet, like uh, this, this critical uh, mutation has to scale up with the inverse of housekeeping genes. The important thing here is that there has to be this kind of threshold. And the idea is that this could be our landscape, this is the, the replication rate of cancer, which will go up with uh, sl a small mutation rates or instability rates. But at some point, you have a, a, a maximum and then drops quickly. And essentially, the idea is that it, because you have instability, you push your populations into a domain where they can be uh, more unstable than the standard tissue. The question is, can you push them forward uh, a little more, and then the system is unable to persist? That's a conjecture that we made. We, we studied. I don't want to go into the details, uh, but we studied that with different versions. For example, what if I have cancer stem cells or more architecture into the tissue? Essentially, the prediction uh, stands. One important prediction here, in, and it was interesting to, to get there, is that I have mutation rates or instability rates that push me, push me more and more and more unstable because every time something fails uh, in terms of preserving um, the stability of the genome, I can, I can touch, I can, I can target genes that are involved precisely in maintaining instability. So instability has to grow. It's nothing can avoid it, right? And one prediction of the model is, yes? Yes. One arm is lost, or very big things. Do you uh, model it in the same way than other types of mutations that affect? Uh, how, how do you take this into account? Okay, L let me let me let me tell you this and, and, and make the connection. Um, one of the predictions here is that if the f the the pace of increasing instability is large enough, right? It doesn't have to be ter terribly large. The system, the the, the wave of uh, phenotypes that crosses the threshold cannot have enough, uh, enough uh, a, a tail in the, in the non-critical part capable of sustaining that. So essentially, one of the predictions is if you go too fast, you can just disappear. And one thing that we did, but we haven't published anything on that, is to do the, the chromosomal instability implementation, which, which is a way, as you were saying, that you, I can make jumps into the instability space. Right? And for that, I can, I can tell. I will say this is going to be something like this. Right? But of course, if you have space, then that everything can slow down, right? So I can I can really I can really answer. One thing that was interesting from this work is that actually, against a little bit of intuition, you can actually cross the threshold and just uh, just that. You can extend that 
And another, another way which I think is important is that we all think in terms of genomes, right? And you can actually map that into having every single cell in your population having a small genome, which is called the digital genome, which is zeros and ones, whether or not you are mutated. And the first thing that we did, this is, could be the idea that you have a sequence space, it could be a four bits, right? Of course, the, the, the real sequence space or even a small sequence space immediately goes into the combinatorial explosion. And you move in this space, right? If you are below the threshold, you will have a population of which essentially is uh, a dominating sequence and then a cloud that goes around. If you cross the threshold, you go into the instability part where everything goes just drifting, right? You cannot sustain information from that, right? Essentially, just saying that it confirms what we found, just special predictions about, for example, the amount of um, instability uh, in terms of a distribution, which gives an exponent of minus one, which is interestingly consistent with some things that have been measured. And if you keep going, and that's what the stuff we is, we, we're working on, and uh, you, you are more careful, you just not put ones and zeros. You, you think in, in, in a genome where you have uh, genes involved uh, having an impact in replication or instability or housekeeping, for example, and then you can actually follow that over time. Um, it's very interesting to see what happens. It's that, uh, on the one hand, contingency plays a role. So the way you, you move into this space, right, depends on the original conditions. But nevertheless, you try to push forward instability as much as you can. And I'm almost finishing. Uh, one of the things that we observe, this, this is kind of a, of a landscape. I don't know if you see it well. Um, we take, this is for, I think that for um, 12 bits genomes, very, very small, yet very small, but enough big to, to actually have a big landscape. Um, here will be a projection of the states that have been uh, occupied by the system. So every single node here means that I have a population. This, this circle is the size of a population, right? That can, for with one mutation, go into another genome, right? The map is really interesting. Uh, we have found a number of really interesting features. Statistically, especially, it's interesting to see that if I look at, for example, at the distribution in log log scale of the strengths here, right? It gives you a power law. Power laws mean that you have a long tail and that the variance is really, really high. It, it tends to diverge, which means that the averages are not well defined, right? So maybe this idea of having a, an average cell or an average genome may be just uh, contradictory. One huge problem, and many of you know, working in, 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 in genomics, is how do you visualize that and how to make a map of that. This is one of the instances we did from that previous image here, this kind of projection, which is a number of techniques to make the network as, you know, as, 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 as distributed as possible. We take every single population from the modeling, from the simulation, and count how many cells are there, kind of a rough measure of how fit is this. And maintain the connections in this, in this picture, right? This is a really huge landscape. And as you can see, even, even uh, with this nice display, it's, it's not trivial to see what is there, okay? And um, this is, my, this is a, a, a suggestion for you, for those of you interested in the idea of landscape, et cetera. Um, this is a work that has been done recently. I'm, I'm talking, about, talking about the right description, right? Uh, using simple strings using models that are based on differential equations. Every single kind of model has strengths and, and weaknesses. Uh, Susana Manrubia, who was uh, on a former student of mine, now is, she's in Madrid leading a, a lab on, on uh, models and evolution, um, proposed with, his, with her colleagues uh, recently the idea of multiscape. It's a, it's a different way of approaching the, the picture of landscape using um, a multi-scale description where you can actually put phenotypes in place. It's not the place to explain in everything, but I strongly recommend you to give a look because I think this is the, the way of actually approaching the problem. And um, from my, what I show you, our conjecture is uh, unstable tumors have to push themselves into criticality. That has a lot of implications. That might be a really deep source of robustness for them, right? Uh, but also a deep source of fluctuations. We know from the theory that that implies some fragilities. So could we exploit that kind of fragilities? And, but this is kind of a paradox, because the idea is 
Um, being unstable means that you generate a lot of noise in a way, right? But the convergence is to a state where the stationary state is unstable. So it's kind of a paradox, but I guess this is what, as Niels Bohr said, uh, the way we make progress. When you confront something that is really non-intuitive, we, we need to really understand what is there. Thank you. critical point is a very interesting concept, but how can you adapt it to the fact that the cancer genome, well, the human genome is very long, so you might have also high instability with no effect on some cells and yes. big effect on other cells depending on where it is hitting, right, at the same time, particularly in big tumors where you have <coughs> loads of cells. So does it mean that the critical point is then pushed, or it is more uh, flexible with large populations and large genomes? Right, that, that, that's, a good, that's a very good point, because usually when you think criticality, we think that more or less everyone is behaving the same way close to criticality. You have a very high heterogeneity. That's an open question. Uh, we do have models of critical systems that involve heterogeneity. And uh, what I was saying at the beginning, that even that, even because even under the presence of this heterogeneity, there are universal phenomena that happen there. But in, if, of course, in tumors, you have heterogeneity and it's distributed in space, mm. right? So there are two differences with respect to the original idea. So how, how, what is the impact of that? I don't know. Can I ask a second question? So, and, and then if, if let's, let's suppose particularly in advanced cancer, let's say they are really pushing very hard the system. Do you think that, one might think of a therapeutical intervention to push even more so mm -hmm. that they die because yeah. you are just at the border. But yes, yes, that's at that's the beginning of the first papers we, we wrote, the idea that you know, in RNA viruses, that idea of you know, lethal mutagenesis that you can push the system forward. Um, as you probably know, there, there are consequences of that. If you use a mechanism that is, is uh, cytotoxic for everyone, it's is not very good news. Um, on the other hand, uh, one of the things that I get from, especially from people in the, in the, in the clinical side, is uh, to, very often is, is the indirect evidence. Uh, those tumors, at least in some cancers, that whether you have uh, more instability, they have better prognosis. So that means that uh, they probably have fragilities that you can exploit and are related with the fact that you are already close to criticality. But beyond that point, I. I if I'm, I'm honest, I, I think that we still need more information. And, and one of my hopes is that the single cell story provides really good insight for that. I have a, qu a question. One, one thing that happens to many tumors oh, is, is, me, <laughs> is that they, one of the things that they have is wall genome duplication. And this yes. seems to be much more uh, general than we thought initially. And uh, this probably makes them uh, more flexible or plastical in uh, generating mutations and tolerating them. I don't know how 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 this fits into into this. Yeah, I, I, this is one thing that we are working uh, uh, with with the modeling story because the the, the the chromosome level it's it's a different it's a different story in a way. What what I will say is that this of course and there are some kind of cancer of which is very visible that you have uh, this kind of uh, push into hypermutability that you you easily get uh, into, a, into a state where you're very fragile. Um, there are two different stories, and I, I will say that for the early events, that's clearly something that makes a difference. Uh, the question is, uh, once you go into the tissue level um, and you got into a state where you have heterogeneity in space, whether or not all kinds of phenomena converge. Right? You cannot keep doing uh, a lot of chromosomal instability, Right? But for me, that's, that's an open question also. Okay, so thank you very much.